My name's Isabel Knight, and I'm a patient. I'm also a writer, researcher about hypermobility, and I'm a Bowen therapist. So it was my highly enlightened ballet teacher who, when I was about 13, and this was in 1988, a long time ago now, um, who first spotted that I was hypermobile and um, suggested that I had larger than normal range of movement. Now, this is highly advantageous in the ballet, dance, performing arts sectors, and of course for um, lots of sports, but that's providing that it's not symptomatic, that it's asymptomatic. If it's um, symptomatic, it becomes more of a problem. So it was to be some 20 years later, in fact, before I actually got a diagnosis. So just fast forwarding just slightly, I went around numerous um, medical experts. I don't know how many, probably at least 20 or more. And the comments I would be getting would be like, your, your back's quite flexible, or um, sometimes your back is horrendous, but you know, it wasn't very helpful. And um, you know, my, my feelings towards the medical profession, my trust um, diminished um, considerably over this time. Um, because they were starting to imply things like um, this is psychosomatic, it's um, all in your head. Um, and the other problem is that I look deceptively well, so you know you can't really see that actually underneath this there is um, quite a lot of a problem going on. So what were the clues? Why did no one join the dots in my case? So my early medical history suggests that I had development coordination disorder or dyspraxia, which is very common in hypermobile people. Then follow um, sleep problems when I was about seven, bladder problems, gastrointestinal problems, um, soft tissue injuries, I had fractures, two partial dislocations, um, and then moving on to chronic lower back pain that, um, that uh, led to chronic widespread pain, um, factor in anxiety, autonomic um, nervous system dysfunction, depression, and pelvic pain. So in 2008, I uh, actually injured myself again, and I partially tore uh, my calf doing ballet. And I decided I would see a physiotherapist who was um, an expert in working with dancers. And she uh, made a diagnosis of my hypermobility and said, well, there's far more going on than you just having hypermobile joints here, hearing, having heard part of my medical history, and sent me to a consultant rheumatologist. And finally, I got my diagnosis. So this had taken 20 years um, of time delay. So um, at that point, um, it was a huge relief to finally know that after all of this, there really was something that was going wrong. Um, it wasn't just hypermobile joints, there was all sorts of different things. So I was diagnosed with hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, and thereafter began my journey around hospitals as I was sent to um, gastroenterologists, neurologists, um, gynecologists, um, pain management psychologists, um, physiotherapists, you name it, I was sent there. Um, having had no interest in me whatsoever, suddenly I'm exploded with letters from appointments here, there and everywhere. And at one point I thought, maybe I should just move into hospital. <laughs> So, was I feeling lost? Certainly. Confused? Definitely. But as I said, it was a real relief to finally know um, what had been going wrong with, in my body for years. And then followed anger and sadness as I reflected on how much of my life quality had been lost at the helm of a connective tissue disorder and my hypermobility and how difficult that had made my quality of life, my working life, <coughs> Um, and yes, there was a lot of loss there. As medical professionals, you, one of the most important things I would recommend is please, please listen to the patient's story because they are providing essential clues that could lead to an earlier diagnosis. You may 
be the first person who actually picks this up and then can send the patient on to other experts, to rheumatologists for diagnosis, for physiotherapy, for pain management psychology, um, to orthopaedics, wherever it is that they need to go. There is a big element of trust involved in working um, with hypermobile people. They get fed up because they have told their story time and time again. And are you going to be any good and as the next doctor? So you need to spend considerable time. Trust building is essential because this is a very difficult condition to manage. It requires a lot of effort from the patient to manage. So developing a, a, a trust and rapport are really extremely important. I'm very lucky now because I feel that I'm relatively well managed. I've had to do extensive physiotherapy, um, particularly over the last six years um, since my diagnosis, but it is an ongoing thing. Every day I'm in pain somewhere. I have to do my exercises. It's also <coughs> nutritionally, there's things that I need to eat or not eat. You know, it's, it's a, you have to be very disciplined as a patient. It takes a lot of commitment um, to keep well with this condition. Um, and it is exhausting. And as we've heard from other speakers, the, the fatigue is absolutely horrendous. It just feels like the battery has gone um, or you feel very brain fogged. Um, and I think that one of the, the things is that you know we want to look for quicker diagnosis for future generations so that um, diagnosis is made much sooner and that therefore patients can then get the right management as soon as possible it requires a multidisciplinary team and you all need to work together patient and the many experts involved in the patient's care thank you very much